Hello. So today we're going to be talking about the determinants of demand. And they're called that because they are just that. They determine demand. Okay, so don't forget what we talked about the other day with the law of demand. So remember how we asked everybody how much they like Starburst in the classroom? So we drew a, a graph out of that, our market graph of demand, and it followed the law of demand. So as the price decreased, the quantity demanded decreased. So the law of demand states that the quantity demanded will decrease as long as all other things are equal. Ceteris paribus, that all other things equal. So each of those little points that I drew along the line, those are just price quantity combinations. They are quantities demanded. I like to draw a little dotted line down uh, and then that shows me that it's crossing the x-axis there quantity. It's just a quantity. It's, it's not demand. Demand is the whole enchilada. So here I'm going to draw demand. Demand is the whole line. That's, that's what demand is. It's the whole curve. It's not just one little bit of the curve. It's the whole curve. So anytime that you have anything else changing in the marketplace, so we're no longer ceteris paribus, all other things being equal, <clears throat> then we have an actual change in demand. However, if price only changes, as the price goes up and down, we're just moving along points on that line. We're just moving along the curve. Demand is the same. So your demand for Starburst at, if you maybe you demand 10 Starburst at 10 cents a pop, and you demand one Starburst at 50 cents a pop, your demand is the same. Everything else is equal. That's just your demand curve. Okay, so what does determine demand? Well, basically anything else changing in the marketplace. So demand is made up of all sorts of stuff. It could be like something you like, um, how many people you are around to sell the good to, what else is on sale. Uh, all sorts of things make up demand. Think about the Starburst activity. My demand for Starburst might have been different than somebody who loves Starburst demand. Some people demanded lots of Starburst no matter what the price is, was just because they liked it. Chances are maybe they were hungry that day, so your hunger could obviously have an effect on it. Maybe you just love Starburst. Um, personally, I've been doing that activity for two years in class, and I've never had one of the Starburst, even though I've already bought them, so it wouldn't cost me anything to have them, because I just don't like Starburst. <laughs> if the candy isn't chocolate, I'm not eating it. So it's just a, a personal matter a lot of times, but it has to do with a lot of things. And so there's six determinants that we're going to talk about in particular that are those determinants that make up what demand is. Okay, so the first determinant is consumer tastes. Consumer taste is really simple. It's just whether people like something. Um, this can be have to do with fashion. So I don't know if you guys remember Beanie Babies. These were, maybe you had them in your crib when you were a toddler, because I think they were popular by the time you were born. But when I was in elementary school, they were a craze sweeping the nation. My aunt used to buy and sell Beanie Babies on eBay. This was in the early days of the internet, of course. <laughs> for Some for over $100. De Beanie Babies were just in hot demand all over the place. Today, I have not heard of anyone who has bought a Beanie Baby in the last many years. <laughs> They're just out of fashion. So personal taste can also have an impact. Think about the, the Starburst activity again. So some people really like Starburst, some people don't. Um, seasonality. So the demand for something like apple cider, obviously it's only available in the fall, but if it were demanded all year, or if it was available all year round, demand would go way up in the fall because people like to do folly stuff in the fall. Sometimes regional tastes can have things to do with this, so I don't know if anyone has heard of Vegemite before, maybe if you've been to Australia or something, or you've been to Britain, but it's this horrible, awful vegetable-based spread that just tastes salty and disgusting, and people in Australia love it. They grew up with it, just like there's some weird stuff, I don't know, maybe like Slurpees or something that gross someone out from Australia. Um, that, that just depends on, you know, if you grow up with it or not. So consumer taste can include a whole lot of different things. So you see this arrow that I drew in from the change in demand? 
Um, demand cannot shift out or in. You may remember with PPFs, demand shifting, or excuse me, the, the production possibilities frontier shifting in and out. Well, with, uh, w with the market graph, demand can only go, let me change my marker color here. So demand, if it decreases, so you can, you can call it a decrease in demand. And this is really messy, sorry. This is also called a shift left in demand. So either of those two terms are acceptable. However, what is not acceptable, not ever, never, ever, is shifting in. The demand isn't shifting in because when we get to supply, suddenly, so, so supply goes this way, suddenly going, well, I guess what looks like in is also like up and everything is this backwards and it'll really confuse you. So make sure you're talking about either a decrease in demand or a shift left in demand. And again, if it's just moving to a point along the line, that would be a decrease in the quantity demanded. If we are going to the right, so we have a shift that way, this would be called, so an increase in demand, or as I just said, a shift right. And I'm clearly filling up the space. So let's move on to the next one here. Okay, next, consumer expectations. Consumer expectations are really easy to get confused with consumer tastes, so try not to get them confused too much. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, consumer expectations are expectations only about the price or availability of a good. It's nothing about seasonality, so um, it has nothing to do with, you know, people liking ice cream in the summer. That's, that's consumer taste. People like ice cream in the summer because it makes them feel cool. People have a taste for cooling down when they're hot. Consumer expectations is only about the price or availability of a good. So for instance, here I've drawn the market for iPhones. Terribly, mind you. Maybe I can make this slightly better. Okay, so the market for iPhones. I remember over the summer, I was thinking about buying a new iPhone. Um, or, well, buying a iPhone. I had a four-year-old dumb phone. Um, and I knew that the iPhone 5 was coming out uh, in, I don't know, September or something like that. And I was going to wait until the iPhone 5 came out because even though I was I was going to get the old cheap model, the, the free one you can get from Verizon with a contract, once the new iPhone came out, I could get the next model up for free. And I think that a lot of people would have uh, would have had the same same expectation and I assume that iPhone sales probably went down during this time when it was expected people knew that the iPhone 5 was going to come out soon so they were gonna hold off on buying it for now because the next model up would uh, would be coming out soon or for instance if you know that a good is gonna go on sale next week why buy it now you can just wait till it goes on sale and so again which way are we shifting it's not in or out it is either a decrease in demand as I've drawn it here or you could call it a shift left. Sometimes too you'll see economists and I'll do this in future slides too call these D1 and D2. So maybe you can think of the Mighty Ducks movies or something while you do these but um, D1 and D2 that's usually how I'll abbreviate these so you know that the one is the original curve, two is the second curve. Okay, our next determinant is substitute goods. Substitute goods. These are just what they sound like. Goods that can be substituted for each other. So, if you're graphing the market for margarine and butter happens to go on sale this week. Okay, so there's that D1 nomenclature that I was talking about. So, if we're graphing the market for margarine and butter is on sale this week, are as many people going to buy margarine? Well, probably not. You're probably going to have a decrease in demand for margarine or a shift left in demand for margarine from everybody. So again, this is at all price levels simply because butter is on sale, so they can buy butter instead of margarine. 
This is one of the two related goods that makes up two, two separate determinants. This is the next related good that we're going to talk about. So complementary goods. Complementary goods are things that are used together with the good that you're graphing. And that or shouldn't be in there. Okay, so for instance, peanut butter. If jelly goes on sale this week, are people more likely to buy a complementary good that goes with it? Well, yeah, of course. So peanut butter sales might go up, demand might increase, go from D1 to D2 there for peanut butter, simply because jelly's on sale. Nothing's happened to the price of peanut butter necessarily. It's just the mere fact that jelly is on sale. So the marketplace is no longer the same. The, both the examples I gave here with these related goods had to do with things going on sale, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be have to do with going on sale. Uh, it could be maybe when blueberries are in season in August, the sale of pie crusts goes up because people are making blueberry pies with them. So just any time that um, something something changes, like like the price or availability of the related good changes, so. You know, if the price of the related good for a substitute, if the price goes up, you are more likely, your demand will increase for the good that you're concerned with. For complements, just the opposite. If the price of the complementary good goes up, you're less likely to buy the good that you're concerned with, and your demand will then go down. Okay, next is income. <clears throat> So income is pretty much what you expect. However, there's these two strange vocab words that you definitely need to remember. So normal goods, most things, this kind of makes sense. If you have more money, if your income goes up, you are going to have a greater demand for things. So here I've drawn a demand curve for groceries. So if your income goes up, your demand for groceries in general will probably increase your demand curve will shift to the right. However, inferior goods, this does not mean that they are of inferior quality necessarily. It simply means that they are, they are goods for which as people's income decreases, there will be less demand for those goods. So here's a story that I remember hearing about during the height of the financial crisis. So dollar stores were just sweeping the nation. The only retailers that were doing better basically in the recession were dollar stores. They were going all over the place because people's income went down. So here I, I drew this wrong before, but as people's income went down, their demand for inferior goods, so cheap cheap stuff at dollar stores, call it D3, my favorite Mighty Ducks movie. Um, demand for dollar store groceries went up because their incomes went down. Most goods don't operate uh, like this. Most goods are normal goods, but certain things, you know, think of like, um, well, dollar stores, obviously, ramen noodles, maybe, um, any anything that is a, a cheaper substitute, I guess, for something more expensive. Okay, and we finally made it to the last of the determinants for demand, market size. Market size is simply the size of the market that you're selling the goods to. It could be the number of people in the town, uh, it could be, you know, the number of people in the country if you're selling to a national market. So, as I've talked to you about before, I think, I'm from Frankmuth, and I used to work at the Fudge Kitchen. So, in the summer, there's lots of people in Frankenmuth because, the, you know, the hotels are full. So, you could say that, you know, the temporary summer population of Frankenmuth is high. So, say that's D1. But then in the winter, I, I usually wouldn't even work between Christmas and maybe March or April, because there just aren't any people in town. Uh, there's certainly amongst the tourists who buy fudge. Um, so again, we have a D2, we have a decrease in demand, or a shift left in demand, um, because the market is smaller. You could also say, maybe if we were talking about ice cream, that this could constitute a change in consumer tastes. We also sold ice cream at the store that I worked at, and we wouldn't sell very much of that in the winter. But that has to do with consumer taste, not market size. Um, well, you could make the argument either way. So 
this really makes a good point that the lines are kind of blurred between these sometimes. It can kind of depend on the explanation that you give. Uh, so as long as you have uh, an explanation that makes sense, I'll generally accept those. And that is just about it for the determinants of demand. So thanks for listening, and we will be working on this in class over the next few days.